thank you so much for allowing me to come and talk here about our uh, study on saliva testing to catch, capture asymptomatic and pre-symptomatic individuals. So the genesis of the study really came from frustration about Canada's attitude towards testing. If we look at exemplar countries, countries that have done a really great job at reducing the amount of infections and in fact eliminating it in many other countries, we can see that they invest very heavily in testing the population. So here, and keep in mind that this is a log scale you're looking at, I'd like you to compare the testing rates of countries like New Zealand, Singapore, Thailand, Iceland, South Korea to what we're doing in Canada. And these are countries that have committed to finding and tracing every single case and finding their source. And as a consequence, they do a lot more testing than we do. And in fact, we don't have a really good testing strategy that allow, has allowed us to bring uh, sporadic community transmission down below about 20%. And in our worst days, we had 80% of the cases where we couldn't trace where the cases were coming from. Sorry. So one of the issues here is that this virus is very unusual in that it deals, it's uh, spread through both asymptomatic, pre-symptomatic and symptomatic cases. If we do our favorite comparator, which is influenza, it follows the rules that we teach in immunology, which is basically symptomology follows viral load. In influenza, what you see is that people who don't have symptoms have 10 to 100 times less virus than people who do have symptoms. And as a consequence, uh, the spread is generally higher from people who are in that pre-symptomatic or symptomatic stage. Now, SARS-CoV-2 is very unusual because there is no correlation with symptoms and viral load. And this is a, a study here that was done in a, a, a long-term care facility showing these cycle thresholds for the genes and symptomology. And what you can see is that you have asymptomatic people who have reasonably high loads. You have lots of people who are sort of pre-symptomatic and this pre-symptomatic period can last a long time who have very high viral loads. And then you see people with sort of the typical symptomology who's, who have a huge range. And of course, one of the other issues is especially in populations like in long-term care and children, uh, the symptoms don't always follow sort of that, that checklist we all look through. And so the viral load may also be associated, be fairly high in people who have atypical presentation of symptoms. So the debate about how much of SARS-CoV-2 is actually asymptomatic is, is currently raging. But one of the things that is quite different from influenza is where maybe as many as 20% of some populations may be um, asymptomatic. The pre-symptomatic phase is fairly short between one and three days and the major time of spread is estimated to be about 24 days uh, before symptoms start. SARS-CoV-2, we have at least 20% of the population is truly asymptomatic and other people have such mild symptoms that they often mistake them for all the other headaches and fatigue that we feel in our daily life. The pre-symptomatic period is longer for people who will generate symptoms. We estimate about five days, but in truth, it can be between three and 27 days, especially in unusual populations like long-term care. And so as a consequence, we believe that the majority of transmission from uh, SARS-CoV-2 can happen uh, in this uh, five-day period, which is, can be frequently associated with having a high viral load. And so again, this is another large study looking at uh, time zero being the first day of symptoms and looking at viral load, and then looking at this pre-symptomatic period in this case. And you can see exactly as I just said, you know, there's some people who have extremely high viral loads in the pre-symptomatic period, some have low, but there's really no correlation with viral load between that asymptomatic and pre-symptomatic uh, period. So as a consequence, our best modeling is that 40 to 50% of infections are spread through either this asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic stage. And unfortunately, very unusually, the frequency of asymptomatic or very, very mild infections is much higher in younger people. As a consequence, the, uh, this is our case rates in Hamilton as of, as of yesterday, and you can see that it's 20, the 20 somethings, uh, 30 somethings who have uh, the highest number of cases. And there's been many, many studies showing that people in sort of their working or school age lives have the most social contacts and ergo spread the virus the most. So here we've got this, this powder keg of spread where we've got people not exhibiting symptoms but having a huge number of social contacts. Our frustration in starting the saliva study came from the fact that the majority of Canada, and there are some provincial differences, but the majority of Canada still only has testing uh, 
frequent testing for people with symptoms. And so we've completely ignored this asymptomatic population. And this is particularly problematic in places like long-term care or retirement communities where the young working people are bringing the infections into the home and not having really good frequent screening. This incredible frustration led my colleague and co PI Eric Brown to write a, an op-ed for the Globe and Mail about how the NBA and uh, uh, American universities were using asymptomatic saliva-based testing to, to capture these people in this asymptomatic, pre-symptomatic stage, and Canada wasn't implementing this. So after Eric wrote his editorial, he felt that he had some skin in the game and he really had to get a study uh, testing to see if we could set up a saliva-based testing uh, to keep the people we care so much about being the researchers in the IDR safe. So he said to me, Don, you know, do you think we could pull this off? Do you think we could do a feasibility trial for saliva testing? <clears throat> and I said, Eric, we're in the IDR. We can do anything. And so we began. Eric assembled this incredible team of technical staff who had lots of experience, <coughs> sorry, in, um, in PCR-based uh, um, testing. And so these, uh, the technical staff got themselves geared up and we developed a system for collecting saliva in these 50 mil conical tubes, which you see here. We were funded in part by the Juravinsky Family Foundation that's allowed us to uh, test a lot of the people who work in the, the IDR in the MDCL building, as well as community members, also the families of people, because we knew we had to have a wide net to, to be able to catch infections that might be brought into our workplace. But importantly, we also got some seed funding from the Amica retirement community, where we were able to test their, their staff, who they knew that were bringing the infections into the, to the retirement communities, but were not being adequately supported by the province to be tested frequently. So this is what the sort of uh, logistics of uh, nasopharyngeal tests. I'm sure Merrick will correct me because I'm sure there's multiple uh, uh, improvements that his system has made. But effectively, like as mentioned, you get an nasopharyngeal swab, you collect that swab, you process it. There's an RNA extraction protocol, a PCR protocol. This is the WHO gene sets. Uh, different institutions have different gene sets that they use. And then as you heard, there's sort of thresholds where we believe the infection is positive uh, or negative. Our, symptom, our test is a little bit different. So you effectively have to drool in a tube after not eating, drinking, or brushing your teeth for an hour. The, the specimens get to the Brown labs. Uh, we have found that we don't need an RNA extraction. Uh, instead, what we do as part of our BSL-2 plus safety protocols, we heat and activate the virus. And this seems to facilitate enough uh, destruction of the virus that we can access the nucleic acids. We do a very similar PCR reaction. We use a slightly different primer set, primarily because this allows us to multi uh, the primer set. And as, as we heard earlier, there is a degree of uh, availability of supplies and this allowed us to, to do that. Um, we include a human gene so that we can make sure we, we're getting a good quality specimen. And then same thing, we have some thresholds where we believe there's a, an infection. So importantly, <clears throat> we've been eight, our, our test was really, could we do this? Could we process hundreds of samples in an academic lab? Could we uh, sort of repurpose the Brown labs into doing this PCR? And so with the help of our research coordinators, we were a, we've been able to successfully recruit uh, several hundred people and we are doing a large number of tests every single week now. And I'd like to show you some case studies about how frequent saliva testing works. So in our very first week, we were collecting samples we'd recruited from a local retirement community. We had a participant who had been participating in what at the time was of the voluntary recommendation by the province that they that people who worked in these sorts of jobs should have a nasopharyngeal swab every 14 days. So this person had just had a negative nasopharyngeal swab, but had enrolled into our study because uh, she was interested in, in keeping herself and, and the people she worked with safe. So sure enough, she provides us her very first sample and we get a positive re result, which was, neat, uh, which was confirmed the next day at a provincial testing site. 
This also led to an outbreak being declared because in retirement communities, one case is sufficient to cause an outbreak. And suddenly recruitment went crazy at that particular site for our study. Uh, there's nothing like hearing that one of your coworkers has COVID to uh, increase our enrollment. So we were able to do a pretty uh, intensive screen of a number of employees and uh, residents who were able to consent at the site. No more cases were found. The outbreak was declared over a little while later. And this participant, had she only been doing nasal pharyngeal testing, wouldn't, would not have gone for her next test until two days after the outbreak had been declared. So had she not, uh, she never developed symptoms, importantly, she was a true asymptomatic, and she would have gone to work completely infected during this period of time. Had she not been in a study like this, nobody would have caught it because she would have been between her 14 day window. So this is an excellent case about how we have to have an increased frequency of testing for people in these high risk occupations because 14 days is not going to cut it. I was quite worried at the time that she would show up at the provincial testing site and she would be negative because this is a graph of basically the false negative rate from nasopharyngeal swabs. And I think, to be honest, from some of the more recent data, I think this is quite a bit lower, but this is what was published at the time. And it basically said if you get infected on day zero, your chance of having a negative test is actually fairly high until about day three. And then when the viral load increases, it gets quite low. So I was fairly worried that she must have been within this sort of early stage because she'd just gone for a swab that she would show up a negative, but that was not the case. And as we moved through and did more testing, I realized that we shouldn't have been as concerned because we had a crack team of nucleic acid savants uh, working with us. And so um, Dirk had done a uh, sensitivity curve uh, for the genes we were looking at and had found that actually we can detect a fairly low number of viral copies uh, in the saliva. And so our test seems to be fairly sensitive, although we haven't done a head-to-head -head comparison with uh, some of the other tests we've heard about. So here's a second case where we were able to help uh, reduce the slow spread and transmission in a retirement community. So uh, there was a local community that had had uh, a test uh, show positive in January and had increased uh, surveillance testing through our study. They'd recruited more people. Some of the residents of the home who were able to con get consent got involved. Many of the staff got involved. So on February 1st, we found two cases. Presumably those had been infected uh, less than five days because these would all be asymptomatic people. There was no chance that uh, anyone would be providing us a sample when they were symptomatic. Um, those two people were obviously able to be brought out of the workforce because they'd got their results back on February 1st. In uh, on February 4th, there was an additional case. Presumably there could have been a, a link there because that would definitely be within the presumed infection period. Another one on the 8th who may have been in contact with a person in four. Unfortunately, by this time, a number of the residents who were not in our study had become infected. So during this period here, there was a, a high number of cases within the residents of the community. And the last staff member who, who have identified positive was, was done on the 16th. So this is another example of how this sort of mass testing, uh, many of these people would have been missed by what they were doing as sort of the provincial recommendations for testing during this time and has helped uh, them redeploy and get some of the uh, workforce uh, into isolation much quicker than had they not been a part of our study. So one of the things that we get asked a lot is what about scaling up this? Could we make saliva testing more of a regional test? And I want you to look at the incredible technique that Sarah is demonstrating here with that left handed uh, opening of the, the tubes and closing them, brilliant. Our issue right now is that the tubes are too big. So the tubes are too big to fill in uh, most automated systems. And so this is actually not a trivial issue uh, because what it requires is people like Sarah to do this work manually. But once, of course, we've got uh, our tubes pipetted, we can use these robotics handlers. And through a generous donation for, from the Boris Family Foundation, we've been able to increase the scale. And in a, two weeks time, we'll actually be expanding the study to include 2,000 uh, long-term care residents uh, uh, providing two samples a week. So it's scalable, but to a degree that becomes challenging due to the, the size of the tubes that we use. Okay. 
We also get a lot of questions about quality. There's this mythology that saliva is difficult to use. And in fact, uh, Drew, our master of saliva, reports that 85% of the samples are incredibly easy. Occasionally, people have a, a brush their teeth or, um, or have some food. And as a consequence, we, uh, we sometimes see that there are some precipitants in there. Uh, this does affect the quality of our results, which I'll tell you about in a second. Uh, some people don't provide enough sample, uh, but a very low number of people, or they evaporate because they don't put the, the lids on their tube well. And it really is a drool, not a spit. So we don't want the mucus like we want the clear liquid part of the saliva. But overall, uh, it's not been a huge obstacle. We've also not seen age differences. Many of the people who've consented to our study are, are quite a bit older and uh, have not reported issues in providing a saliva sample. Intriguingly, uh, we have observed what I showed you in those earlier slides. There's an incredible rate in, a range in the degree of uh, expression of these genes in these asymptomatic people. So we have some people that are either very, very early in their infection or conceivably late, although we think early, uh, and then some people have fairly high viral loads. To date, we had one indeterminate test. Luckily, that person was local. We could get a second sample from them that afternoon. They confessed that they had indeed brushed their teeth and then drooled into the tube right after, so that's a big no-no. We think we may have had a false negative, although we're not 100% sure. We've had 14 positives that have gone on to be confirmed at provincial testing sites. And we hope to get a better sense of the accuracy by doing uh, antibody levels to see if anyone seroconverted over the course of our study that we wouldn't uh, have been able to detect. Another major question we've asked is how acceptable is this? Do you think this is a good idea? And you know, these the spar chart really doesn't tell the full story. The stories that we've heard about this testing, we've heard stories from teachers in our study who had students in their classroom and were unable to go and get a test uh, because they were told by the powers that be that until they had symptoms that wasn't required. We've had service industry people who've been so worried that they've been uh, unable to, to work effectively or to spend time with their family because they've been so worried about their infections. And we've had the, our, our partners at Amica speak to us about how important testing is for them to be able to socialize, enjoy life, to feel safe and to do the things that you need to keep themselves healthy, like be active, join the gym at the end of the community. And so the um, uh, gratification that we've got from this study is that we've really been able to help our community, both in the MDCL building, but more locally, to help fight uh, these uh, spread of infection due to these asymptomatic or presymptomatic infections. I've talked really quickly because I really wanted to make sure we had time to answer some questions, but I just really have to acknowledge the incredible hardworking team that, that Eric has been able to put together. These people have spent so much of their time and have been so committed to this project. All those tests always have a verification step and we've had them staying up late at night hoping to get people the best quality answer to whether or not they might have had a, a, a positive sample. And I'm so appreciative and it's been an honor to work with them. Um, I am also very, very grateful for the Jurovinsky Family Foundation, which gave us the seed money, the Amica Senior Lifestyles Community, with whom we've had the pleasure to work with, the Boris Family Foundation for allowing us to uh, increase our infrastructure, and of course the IDR for their continuing support. Happy to answer any questions now, or you can contact me through Twitter or email. Thank you so much.